Right. Um, thanks so much for the kind introduction and um, <laughs> for the previous papers. Um, I am indeed going to jump just a little bit back in time now, um, actually to July and August 1544 to be very precise, because in that year, the scholar and humanist and supporter of Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, discussed in several letters to two of his friends, the scholars Joachim Camararius and Christoph Pannonius, a picture with an inscription that he had seen in Frankfurt. In these Latin letters, and I'm sort of summarizing from a couple of letters here, um, Melanchthon saw describes a painting that he saw. It was a painting on a wall, a picture, apparently, and it showed a girl or a virgin sitting alone, either holding a wreath of flowers or winding a wreath of flowers. And the painting was accompanied by an inscription, uh, a German inscription that Melanchthon also provides. And it read, je länger, je lieber, ich bin allein, denn treu und Wahrheit ist worden klein. And that literally translates as, the longer, the better I am alone, or the longer, the more I like being alone. Um, and this, I mean, this is a direct translation, so I think I'm going to have to, you know, put it a bit nicer. Um, for instance, as fidelity and truth are disappearing, uh, I like being alone more and more. Um, and Melanchthon also notes the identity of the plant. And he says that this plant is called in German, the longer the better or more liked, which is actually the first part of the inscription. And he thankfully also mentions the Latin name of the plant, the 16th century Latin name, Amarum Dolce or Bittersweet. And this allows us to identify the plant as Jelenga Liebe or Zolanum Dulcamara, which is a kind of nightshade that still exists today. So this mention of a painting that Melanchthon provided in several letters and that he talked to in lectures, talked about in lectures and with his friends, um, was discussed a lot and received a lot of attention in the 16th and the 17th centuries. And um, I would like to go into more detail here, but I don't have the time. So I would like to point you to an excellent paper on this topic for those who read German um, by Van Katz. Um, so along all of this 16th and 17th humanist and scholar debate, the actual object and its iconography, this, this painting that Melanchthon saw in Frankfurt, gets lost and it's forgotten in this scholarly debate. And since the painting itself is lost as well, the record of the painting and its intriguing iconography seem to have gone completely unnoticed in the history of art. And intriguingly though, we find <laughs> among the many biscuit molds in the collections of the Berlin museums, a small one made out of clay that depicts the same iconography and includes the same inscription as this lost painting. It's a clay mold with a circular image at its center and the, the image's diameter is only eight centimeters. So it's quite a small image. It comes from the Middle Rhine area, so sort of West Central Germany. And it's been in Berlin since the 19th century. This mold, this biscuit mold, shows a woman seated in a garden enclosed by a wattle fence. Um, and the fence actually features a closed gate, so she's completely closed in. At her feet, there is a shape of a coat of arms imprinted within the fence, but nothing is seen as visible inside this coat of arms. The woman is surrounded by flowers and she also holds one in her hand. And a winding scroll above her head provides the inscription that reads, Je länger, je lieber, or et lieber, bin ich allein, wann treue und glauben ist worden klein. So translating roughly to, the longer, the more I like being alone when, or as, fidelity and faith have become small. This inscription again utilizes Solan do Camara's common name, and it seems that the flowers that surround the girl are sort of schematic renderings of Solan do Camara, this bittersweet nightshade, and I tried to show this here in a little detail in the corner. Um, objects like this clay mold were primarily used to shape fine gingerbread dough or expensive marzipan into decorative biscuits. To produce this final product, the biscuit or marzipan treat, several steps of production were needed that involved people from all different kinds of backgrounds and different professions. So at the beginning, there would have been a goldsmith or a medalist who carved the intricate design into the stone. And this would have resulted in a one of a kind, quite expensive, precious object that was used by patricians and wealthy burghers directly as a mold for baked goods and for marzipan. And a, an example of this is, is on the PowerPoint. You can see this here uh, on the left. Uh, it's a stone mold showing a love garden scene. And it's actually dated in the inscription to quite a lot later to our example, to 1579. More often, however, with the medium of this, of this stone mold, clay impressions were taken and 
these were then these were used to create a final clay biscuit mold like the one the object in Berlin that we have in the middle here and with this clay mold a biscuit or gingerbread was then decorated and on the right here I just I flipped the image around the mold around to give you an idea of what the actual biscuit would have looked like because obviously it would have been reversed these biscuits were traditionally made by gingerbread bakers, <laughs> a profession that was actually organized uh, into their own guilds in many cities. And we see here the gingerbread baker Hans Bühl, who died in 1520 in Nürnberg. Uh, it seems, however, that in wealthier households, which had their own cooks and bakers, the biscuits and marzipan treats were made in the house, because thankfully we have a rather odd source um, from the botanist and physician Hieronymus Bock, who writes in his, and I translate, German pantry from 5050. Uh, in the chapter on banquets and suppers, suppers, he describes how the cook sent honey cakes or gingerbread and gilded marzipan decorated with precious crests or emblems to the rooms. So we learned a little bit about the use of these objects, um, but there's a lot that's not known about this context and the context of use. Um, usually the biscuits featuring the biscuit molds that survive that feature religious imagery were suggested to have been eaten on religious holidays, on the occasion of religious holidays, but profane images such as our mold were thought to have been eaten on the occasion of Lamish weddings. But then box description indicates that they may also have been consumed in the context of banquets and elaborate suppers in general. So what is actually the relationship between this lost biscuit, the mold, and the lost painting? I've not been able to find the image or the inscription in any earlier objects, be it tapestries or painting or print, or in writings such as love poetry or in collection of proverbs. Um, my first assumption when I noticed this unlikely link between these two very different objects or lost objects was that there must be an earlier print as an inspiration for both as a common source but so far I haven't been able to find one and actually if anyone in the audience knows of one I'd be very very glad to hear about it so this is a work in progress but as I tried to make clear actually the production of the decorated biscuits included several steps of replication and involved creating faithful copies of an image in the process. And as such, these early and mid 15th century biscuit molds actually predated and then paralleled the print as a convenient and inexpensive way of multiplying images. And this left me wondering, could one object actually have directly inspired the other? They're both from the same region, the mold is from the Middle Rhine, possibly from Frankfurt directly, and the painting was seen in Frankfurt in the middle of the 16th century. Unfortunately, we'll probably never know, unless it resurfaces somewhere, we'll never know the date of the painting, but the closest surviving example of an allegorical painting with such an inscription is found at the back of a portrait of a young man by Hans Jusson Kuhnbach on the Met, and that one is dated to approximately 1508. So it seems quite certain that the biscuit mold predated the lost painting that Melanchthon saw, which suggests that it could have been the biscuit mold directly that inspired the painting, especially since sources do tell us that the final product, the decorated biscuits, were eaten by wealthy merchants, by artists, by pharmacists, by goldsmiths. So by the same people who either created paintings and artworks themselves or by those who commissioned and financed these same artworks. So then what is the meaning of these two objects? What's, what is this iconography? What does it mean? Um, in both the iconography, in both the mold and the painting, plants are utilized in much the same way. The flower wreath, as we've seen in Kohlenbach's uh, verso of the portrait, was wound to be given to a lover as a token of love um, and as a means to literally bind the other person to oneself. And the inscription in Kohlenbach's portrait actually reads, I bind with forget-me-not, again utilizing a plant name. Synonymous, however, to winding a wreath was the act of simply passing a flower to the partner as a token of affection. And we see this here in an engraving from the anonymous master BG, where a, a twig is passed between a couple and it's actually the same plant, probably Solando Gamara, that also makes up his wreath that is passed between them. Importantly, um, wreaths were only worn by virgins and unmarried women um, since they represented their maiden status. And in poetry and in visual culture, this sort of yonic shape of the wreath was rather crudely synonymous of a woman's virginity. Um, and this might be why Melanchthon describes the girl as a virgin directly, because he understood her wreath to indicate her virgin status in the painting. A different kind of motive um, that signaled virginity is employed in the mold. 
Um, here, the enclosed garden draws on the Song of Songs and on Mary Hortus Conclusus iconography. So the enclosed garden with the shut gate aptly depicts both the girl's solitude as well as her virgin state. The inscriptions that we find on both objects um, place both images in the context of world weariness or Weltschmerz in German, lamenting a lack of fidelity and faith and truth in this world. And that's similar, and I apologize for the rather horrible image it's the only one i could find um it's very similar to a biscuit mold that shows a, a hermit on the left sitting in a garden with a young woman a virgin um with a dog between them and this dates from the first half of the 15th century from nearby mines uh, she proclaims her heartache caused by infidelity and she even says that she wants to die and the hermit replies to her she will only find true fidelity by herself in solitude. In the molds and in the paintings inscription, the wording is actually slightly ambiguous. So the inscription can mean either now that fidelity and faith or fidelity and truth have disappeared. I like being alone more and more, but it can also mean when or if fidelity and faith or fidelity and truth disappear. I like being alone more and more. And in this second rendering or a second reading of the inscription, we begin to see that actually both images show a virgin of marriageable age who proclaims that without fidelity, faith or truth, no relationship is worth entering and giving up her precious virgin status. She is shown placing high value in these virtues and is declaring that she would rather stay alone than entering into a partnership devoid of these values. But at the same time, while she declares that she likes this loneliness now, or she will learn to like it, in both the mold and the painting, she holds flowers ready to be given to a spouse, flowers that are even called the longer, the more liked. She's presented ready to bind a potential husband who does possess these most rare virtues. This kind of interpretation would work very well in the context of a betrothal or a marriage feast. And if this biscuit was indeed served as a wedding banquet once, the guests may well have pondered the intricate imagery and the delicate inscription, which could have served as an entertaining treat and a conversation piece. Whether it also inspired the guests to create poetry, like the painting did Philip Melanchthon, we'll sadly never know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah.